modern fighter aircraft stalked the enemy in total darkness. With an incredible array of sophisticated radar and air-to-air -air missiles, there is little difference between day and night ops. But it wasn't always this way. The pioneers of night fighting took to the skies decades earlier. Battle testing new technology and tactics that enabled them to own the night. Now you're in the cockpit as heroic night fighters in Hellcats, P-61 Black Widows, F-3D Sky Knights, and F-15s take to the skies. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of the night fighters. July 4th, 1944, 4.30 a.m. Under cover of night, four American planes of VFN-76, one of the U.S. Navy's first night fighter squadrons, make their way to the island of Chichijima in the Pacific. The four Grumman F-6F Hellcats are radar equipped a new technology that uses radio waves to detect and track other aircraft in total darkness. Their instrument panels glow in dim red light to preserve night vision. 21-year-old Buck Dungan flies element lead. The Hellcat was such a stable machine, we all fell in love with it. Dungan and his wingman, Johnny Deere, split off from their flight lead. They each carry one 500-pound bomb to hit shipping in Futami Cove. The drone of the Hellcat's Pratt & Whitney engines is heard for miles around, alerting the Japanese to the specter of an American attack. Enemy anti-aircraft gunners fire blindly into the night sky. Dungan steers clear of the tracers while using his compass, altimeter, and artificial horizon to navigate, called flying on instruments. Though nighttime combat had occurred as early as World War I, it wasn't until the advent of this sort of advanced instrumentation in the late 1930s that true night fighting and navigation was possible. Soon, Dungan spots a target in the water below, a lightly armored Japanese destroyer escort. We saw a small ship leaving the harbor, and it had an umbrella of fire above it. So I said, Johnny, let's make a low side run. The Hellcats dropped to wave top level for the risky broadside attack. Dungan carefully monitors his altimeter and artificial horizon to avoid hitting the water. The gunners on board the Japanese destroyer have no idea where the night fighters are coming from. Dungan unleashes a torrent of 50 caliber ammunition at the ship. 50 caliber slug is as big around as your thumb, about as long too. At 2,400 uh, rounds per minute from six guns meeting at one place, it's gonna knock holes in just about anything. To preserve night vision, the Hellcats don't use tracers. Even without the tracers, you have a great flash, but you don't look at it. You keep your eyesight way ahead, away from light. Dungan and Deer pull hard back on their sticks to climb over the top of the destroyer escort. I said, Johnny, 
the upstairs is open for us. They, they're inviting us in. And so we made a high side run. Below them, the ship's gunners still have no idea where the Americans are. The Japanese begin firing low out over the water. Dungan and Deer rake the deck, firing down the smokestack directly into the engines. Flames erupt and smoke belches from the wounded ship. It is dead in the water. So here, two Hellcats with 650 calibers apiece took on a fighting ship that had a lot of armament. And we beat up on it, and we sunk it. Without being detected, the Americans have made quick work of the enemy ship. The Hellcats turn their attention to the island itself. They split up, each patrolling his own sector of sky. In night fighting, you assign an area, because then anyone you see is not friendly, and he's a target. Suddenly, a shadow passes overhead. It's a Japanese Navy Zero, equipped with amphibious floats. American pilots call these planes roofs. The roof pilot can navigate at night on instruments, but he has no radar to see in the dark. Undetected, Dungan closes on his enemy's six o'clock. I knew the fuel was carried in the float, so I aimed on the strut between the float and the cockpit and just touched the trigger, just one little the Zero bursts into flame and plummets. The explosion has given away the night fighter's position. Suddenly, tracers rip through the night sky. And I turned and looked, and I had three in back of me who were firing at me. Buck Dungan's top secret training as a Navy night fighter is about to be put to the test. In 1943, Buck Dungan joined the US Navy's night fighter program, codenamed Project Affirm, based at Quonset Point in Rhode Island. Project Affirm and almost all other night fighter programs utilized a technology that in World War II was only in its infancy, radar. Radar, or radio detection and ranging, uses radio waves to detect objects beyond visual range. Radio energy is transmitted from an antenna Objects in the sky reflect some of this energy back to a detector where these radar returns can be processed and used to determine the distance to the target, altitude, and direction of travel. Next to the atomic bomb, the development in various forms of radar was the number two priority for both America and the British. The British used ground-based radar to combat Luftwaffe daylight bombing during the Battle of Britain. As losses mounted, the Germans were forced to fight at night. The RAF needed a new form of radar, something small enough to fit on an individual airplane. This onboard radar would be a fighter pilot's eyes in the dark, allowing him to steal in close to an enemy and make the kill undetected. The radars were big, bulky pieces of equipment, vacuum tubes, and a lot of heat and a lot of, needed a lot of power that the airplanes of the day just couldn't deliver. So the British did a lot of the development of these early radars to be able to fit inside still fairly large aircraft, twin engine versus, say, a Spitfire. This new radar, called Airborne Intercept, allowed night fighters to track individual aircraft in total darkness. The British shared the technology with the US Navy in 1940. By 1942, radar sets could fit on single-engine fighters. 
Project Affirm, America's first night fighter training program, was born. Now, Project Affirm night fighter Buck Dungan is in the crosshairs of three Japanese roofs. But luckily, his wingman, Johnny Deere, is in the area, still undetected by the enemy. And he said, Buck, are you all right? And I said, I've got some company. I'm having all this fun by myself. I'm going to invite you to the party. Dungan is here. Deere is here. Dungan plans to lead the enemy fighters directly into his wingman's line of fire. Johnny Deere streaks in, using the Japanese gunfire as an aiming reference against the night sky. Deere has claimed two of the roofs, but there's still one left behind Dungan. Dungan must reverse direction quickly to turn the tables on the remaining roof. I made a real fast, uh, kill your speed turn, you know, up, up like that and pulled around and, and came in on the fella down here. He just kept coming right at me and he was firing and, and I gave him a short burst. Uh, he blew up. Dungan and Deere once again split up to search for new targets. Dim pre-dawn light breaks on the horizon. Suddenly, Dungan spots more tracer fire arcing towards him. He's been spotted. I saw a plane coming toward me about three miles away, and it, his guns were all firing. The inexperienced Japanese pilot is firing too soon. He runs out of ammo. Dungan carefully puts the pipper on the roof's silhouette and fires. He's made quick work of his opponent. But more roofs are in the air, waiting for the rising sun to light the battlefield. Then I got involved with a very clever fellow who liked to play tag in the clouds. Dungan is here. Another roof is here, trying to duck into a cloud bank. Visibility is already next to nothing. Only the most skilled pilot would attempt to dogfight in the clouds at night. But Buck Dungan is confident and very aggressive. He throttles up and chases the Japanese pilot into the abyss. July 4th, 1944. In almost total darkness, Navy night fighter Buck Dungan in a radar-equipped Hellcat pursues a Japanese float plane into a cloud deck. disappeared in the thick part of the cloud, then came out in the light part. When he came out into the into visibility, I'd give him a burst, you know, even though I wasn't lined up with him. I'd let him know he's got company. The Japanese pilot must do something to shake the tenacious American night fighter. He will throw his aircraft into a steep descending spin. He's hoping Dungan will shoot past and lose sight of him in the darkness. The roof pops his nose up and begins the spin. But Dungan is one step ahead of him. He pulls up to keep from overshooting, then quickly throws the Hellcat into a spin of its own. A spin is an easy thing to do. It's a full back with a stick and right or left rudder, and your nose comes up and you just trail down like this. The Hellcat spins erratically as the aircraft plummets, but Dungan is in complete control, waiting for the right moment to pull out. When you want to come out of it, 
the reverse rudder and, and push the stick forward, and you'll stop the spin immediately. The roof pulls out of its spin. Dungan pushes the stick forward slightly and applies right rudder. The Hellcat responds smartly. Dungan swings in on the roof six o'clock. I could see him landing in a cove quite a distance away. So I elevated my guns and uh, found that, by gosh, if, if I shot up in the air about 20 degrees, my bullets were landing around him. With no tracers, Dungan is accounting for the ballistic drop of the rounds and zeroing in on the roof. Slugs land all around the roof as he hits the water and skips. Dungan fires another burst. White hot incendiary bullets rip into the fuselage. It's an incredible feat of aerial marksmanship. Dungan streaks past the wreckage and climbs back to altitude. Dawn approaches. The night fight will soon be over. Japanese anti-aircraft guns have opened up again, ignoring the risk of hitting their own aircraft. I was marking the position of the anti-aircraft battery. I felt a big explosion, I heard off my left side, and I felt I was hit in the shoulder. And then I turned the mirror down to take a look at me. Now, I've got a ruddy complexion, always did have a ruddy complexion, but the person looking back at me was totally white. And I thought, I don't want to look at that ugly face anymore, so I pushed it up. Dungan's F6F has taken the hammer blows of an unseen roof's 20 millimeter cannon fire. Shrapnel is buried in his left shoulder. His clavicle is shattered. He is in no condition to continue the fight. Oh, it hurt terribly. So I knew it wasn't too bad. Had it been numb, I would have been worried. But it hurt so much that, oh, God, what a cost. I had shrapnel all in my shoulder and the back. Dungan establishes radio contact with Johnny Deere. Deere's Hellcat has also been hit. Now separated, they head back to the safety of American-controlled waters. At daybreak, Dungan manages to make an emergency landing on the carrier Yorktown. His wounds will end his combat career. The three victories on July 4th, 1944, bring his total to seven making him an ace, a deadly, effective night fighter. The U.S. Navy and Marine Corps focused on single-seat night fighters, embodied in the radar-equipped Hellcat. The Army Air Force opted to develop an entirely new type of airplane, designed specifically for night missions, the Northrop P-61 Black Widow. P-61 was the only aircraft in World War II designed from the ground up for night fighting, the only one. The RAF and the Luftwaffe wrote the textbook for night interception, and that started in late 38. The P-61 took everything they learned from the RAF and incorporated it into that plane. Engineers knew a good night fighter needed three things, speed, heavy armament, and excellent radar. The P-61 had all three. It was equipped with twin Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines, giving it a top speed of 365 miles per hour. A crew of three, a gunner, a radar observer, and a pilot. Four 20 millimeters and four 50 calibers. Tremendous firepower. At the heart of its night fighting mission was the P-61's airborne intercept radar, which operated in a similar fashion to previous night fighters. 
a rotating antenna in the nose emits long wavelength radio energy called microwaves. This energy is reflected back by any aircraft within five miles. These radar returns are then processed by the radar operator and used to track the enemy in total darkness. Experienced night fighter pilot Al Jones flew the P-61 over Europe. It was a great airplane. It looked kind of clumsy sitting on the ground, but it was very agile and very uh, responsive. Despite its late arrival in combat, the P-61 became an icon of night fighting. April 1945. A lone P-61 Black Widow, piloted by Al Jones, circles a German airfield completely unseen. Jones and his radar operator, Lefty Rodofsky, are waiting for enemy night fighters to return to base, called an intruder mission. We were all within Germany, and uh, the Lancasters were bombing Kassel, uh, which is a city in Germany, and we could see them off to the north south. Black Widow's radar probes the night sky, searching for prey. My radar operator picked up a signal on his set that uh, there was an airplane coming into the airport. The enemy aircraft is here. Jones is here. Rodofsky will skillfully guide Jones into firing position using only the P-61's radar. Rudofsky uses two scopes to track the German plane. The A scope indicates the range to the target. The B scope tracks its elevation off the nose. He uses this information to relay instructions to the pilot. Rudofsky instructs Jones to turn right. Deep in enemy territory, stealth is their only ally. They must carefully position themselves on the German six without being detected. Soon, Jones gets a visual, a German ME-410, a twin-engine fighter often used for night fighting. We followed him in when he was about three or 400 feet above the runway, like going in for a landing. Undetected, Jones closes in and lines up his shot. All the guns were fixed forward, and we could select them either machine guns only or cannons only or all to together. At night, a single burst will reveal his position. Jones carefully centers the pipper on the target. He squeezes the trigger. German night fighter plunges down in flames. The airfield below erupts with anti-aircraft fire. Al Jones pulls up, opens the throttle, and makes a hasty departure. Amazingly, he arrives back at base unscathed. World War II laid the foundation for night fighting. And drove technological innovation. But the struggle to own the night would continue unabated into a new era in aviation. The jet age. Air combat in pitch black conditions at over 500 miles per hour will test American pilots as never before. January 12, 1953.
In total darkness, a formation of American B-29 bombers approaches their target at Sinuiju, North Korea, escorted by F-3D Sky Knights of the U.S. Marine Corps. The F-3D is equipped with powerful onboard radar, one of the first jet fighters built specifically for nighttime combat operations. It achieved the name of Willie the Whale real quick. It looked like a black whale. And the radar operator and the pilot sat side by side. Had a huge fuselage, twin engines, subsonic, but tremendous fire power with 420 millimeters and outstanding radar. The F-3D's radar covers a 170-degree sweep in front and a 144-degree sweep in back. Marine Major Jack Dunn pilots one of the Sky Knights. Dunn and another F-3D pilot circle the bomber box to maximize the coverage their onboard radar provides. As the B-29s make their drop, the Sky Knight's radar peers into the dark, scanning for threats. Then, ground control crackles over Dunn's radio. MiGs are in the air, but they're not engaging. The B-29s begin their egress. Suddenly, a MiG-15 thunders past. Somehow, the Sky Knight's onboard radar has missed the bandit. The guy probably came up from an angle beyond the 170 degrees, down the cone radar did not pick him up. Dunn's night fighter instincts kick in. He charges after the MiG. Radar operator Larry Fortin begins tracking the target. As Dunn closes the gap, he can't believe his eyes. The MiG has left his wing lights on. This is not standard operating procedure. Something's wrong. He said, I'm being lured into a trap. The Marine pilot is aggressive, willing to take the risk to make a kill. He throttles up, continuing to close with the MiG. It's just the mentality of a Marine fighter pilot. I want to get the MiG to heck with it, you know, and they took their chance. Suddenly, blinding light fills the cockpit. Searchlights from below track the F-3D's movement across the sky, and anti-aircraft gunners open up. He said it just lit up the cockpit like it was noon. It lit them up to where the AAA could, could get a beat on. The only way to track the MiG is with the F-3D's onboard radar. Larry Fortin will have to talk Jack Dunn through a dogfight with a MiG-15. The MiG-15 is a fast and agile opponent. The swept-wing jet fighter is armed with two 23-millimeter and one 37-millimeter cannon, an airplane built to climb to altitude and destroy American bombers. The MiG-15 is much faster and is more heavily armed. The Sky Knight's slower speed allows it to turn tighter, but at night, the F-3D's onboard radar is its greatest advantage. They had a tail warning radar that went out four miles. So if a MiG tried to slip in behind an F-3D, they, the pilot would be alerted way before they got in firing range and could take evasive action. Then they had a lock-on radar for the guns. Once they got locked on that target, it had a range of 4,000 yards, which is over two miles. Then the pilot could take over with the RO's help, close the gap, he'd get a good solution on the radar, the radar would lock the guns on, fire, and he had a kill. With searchlights tracking him across the sky, Jack Dunn relies solely on the instructions of his RO, Sergeant Larry Fortin. Anti-aircraft shells burst all over the night sky. It's been said that being a night fighter is akin to being a police car chasing a bank robber, except the police car driver is blind, and you're having to describe to the driver what the other car is doing, when to turn, when to speed up, when to slow down, and do that all at night. 
the jets streak towards the deck. Dunn flies in and out of the searchlights, angling for a shot. I mean, they're flying in pitch black. And you know, Ford is saying, you got him, you got him, you're closing, you got him. Stay with it. At 700 yards, the F-3D's radar locks on and adjusts the pipper to help Dunn line up an accurate shot. He fires a burst. The MiG is hit, but he stays in the fight. The North Korean pilot pitches down into a screaming dive. Dunn follows, his eye on the altimeter. Somehow, he must make the kill and still leave enough time to pull out. The MiG plummets, the Sky Knight in hot pursuit. January 12, 1953. Marine night fighter Jack Dunn dives in pursuit of an enemy MiG-15. Dunn must make the kill, but leave enough time to pull out. His eyes dart between the altimeter and his target. Dunn already had the momentum. He was within range. Falling down, three short bursts, and the MiG caught on fire. Lethal 20-millimeter cannon shells arc through the night sky and shred the MiG. Dunn jams the stick in his gut, straining against the pull of G. The night fighter soars skyward, the smoking wreckage of the MiG-15 in his wake. He throttles up and heads for home. His aggressiveness has paid off. He has scored his first kill, one of only six made by F-3D crews during the entire Korean War. The Korean War showed that jet combat at night was possible. During the following decades, night and all-weather radar intercept capabilities steadily increased. Once Korea was over with, the weapons became much more sophisticated. So to make the kill, all you had to do was make sure your weapons were locked on, fired it, and they found the target. Night and all-weather fighting started to be incorporated into the conventional capability of all fighter aircraft. By Vietnam, the dedicated night fighter was becoming a thing of the past. The number of aircraft types just kept shrinking and shrinking to now it's gone from four or five true night fighter types in World War II. Hellcat Corsair, P-61, bow fighter. It's dwindled down now where anything flying in the day can do the same thing at night. In the decades following Vietnam, the United States advanced the tactics and technology of night fighting and beyond visual range combat more than any other nation. No fighter embodies this more than the F-15 Eagle. March 24, 1999, the first night of Operation Allied Force. The combined air forces of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, descend on Serbia. F-15 Eagles fly MiG cap for the massive multinational strike force. One of these flights is led by Major Robert Renner, call sign Cricket. I'd flown combat missions over northern Iraq in 1995, but was honestly thinking, you know, this is going to be a little bit different. It's not just enforcing a no-fly zone where you might occasionally see someone shooting at you, but this is going to be for real. Flying element lead in the flight of four is Lieutenant Colonel Cesar Rodriguez, call sign Rico. He's an experienced F-15 pilot with two MiG kills in Desert Storm. There's only two of us who had Desert Storm experience in our squadron. 
We had a whole new generation of fighter pilots that was more technically proficient, in my opinion, than those of us who fought in Desert Storm because they were seeing the benefits of a Desert Storm in how the radars were developed and the new weapons were developed. Shortly after arriving on station, Rico picks up an unknown contact on radar. At any time of the day or night, modern fighter pilots coordinate with airborne warning and control aircraft, called AWACS. The AWACS and F-15 use sophisticated radar and electronics to illuminate the nighttime battlefield. An AWACS on station over northern Italy confirms Rico's contact. A Yugoslav Air Force MiG-29. The MiG-29, designed during the 1980s, is a Mach 2-capable air superiority fighter. It uses both heat-seeking and long-range radar-guided missiles. The 1970s-era F-15C Eagle was the first U.S. fighter specifically built for air-to-air -air combat since the F-86 Sabre. The F-15C's radar can identify and track targets at 90 miles, day or night. Still over 40 miles away, Rico's F-15 locks up the MiG. It was really what I call a very uh, amazing uh, moment. We're at 30 plus thousand feet. We're doing Mach 1.4. We hear, as we call, haul in the mail, and I take my shot. I'll remember this forever. I hear him call Fox 3 over the radio meaning he's just shot an AMRAM at this MiG-29. So I'm 20 miles away, and I see the little point light come off his airplane and start track, you know, going to track the MiG-29. The AMRAM is first guided by the F-15. Then its own active radar in the body of the missile kicks in. The missile makes tiny adjustments as it streaks through the night sky. Seconds later, impact. I was actually fighting over a piece of ground that was not only mountainous, but covered in snow. So that fireball takes the reflection of the fire, multiplies it by all the mountains around us. If you were to take two or three football stadiums right next to each other, and then all three of the main light switches, you switch them on at the same time, that's what it looked like. Rico Rodriguez has scored his third MiG kill. It's a stunning demonstration of the dominance of technology in modern night fighting. But there are more MiGs rising to defend their homeland. To the north of Rico and Cricket, another F-15 pilot, Captain Mike Schauer, call sign Dozer, streaks into battle. He is informed of Rico's engagement over the radio. We heard through AWACS that there was an engagement in the south, that we got a splash one in the south call. Uh, kind of, it piques your level of attention up a little bit. Dozer's senses are heightened by the presence of the enemy. He monitors his radar constantly, his only means of peering into the dark abyss that surrounds him. Soon, he will find himself in one of the most intense dogfights of the entire conflict. March 24, 1999. F-15 Eagle pilot Captain Mike Schauer, call sign Dozer, escorts a formation of F-117s to their targets near Belgrade. The stealth fighters are virtually undetectable at night, but they have no air-to-air -air defense. Dozer and three other F-15s are tasked with protecting them. Dozer's radar scans the night sky, searching for any sign of the enemy. Soon, he gets a contact. I brake lock, look a little bit. Uh, about 30 seconds later, now I see it starting to march back down the scope, because initially it was going away from me, so we're kind of chasing it this way, and now it's turned high. AWACS confirms its identity, a Yugoslav MiG-29. It's headed directly for 
with a strike package. The MiG-29 is at 10 o'clock low and 25 miles away. The F-15 gains radar lock. Dozer fires two missiles. They're called missiles, they miss, not hittles. So, you know, always shoot two to up what we call your PK, your probability of kill. Dozer watches the missiles streak away, but the darkness conceals another aircraft in the middle of the fight, invisible even on radar. In the meantime, which I didn't know and I found out the next night, there was an F-117 directly between myself and the MiG. Before the war, I asked him, I said, hey, you know, we're gonna be above you, depending on where the MiGs are and where you guys are, we may be shooting through you, flying through you. Is that okay? And the weapons officer's like, yeah, it's big sky theory, don't worry, we'll never be close to each other. The missiles roar past the F-117's cockpit, within feet of knocking the aircraft down. And all of a sudden, that first missile whew, over the top of his airplane motor burner, and second missile whew, over the top of his airplane, he's like, oh, good God. And so he starts doing this look, and uh, you know, what's, he's, like, he's got MVGs on. He's like, I'm in the middle of a doggone shootout right now. Unaware of how close he's come to knocking down a friendly aircraft, Dozer monitors the missiles. First missile times out, nothing. And then I'm waiting for the AIM-7. Just as the AIM-7 times out, the target starts to maneuver in a right-hand turn towards the beam. So I'd be looking at him like this. Dozer is here. The MiG-29, alerted to his presence, is now in a climbing right turn towards him. The F-117 is here. The stealth fighter is undetected in the middle of the dogfight. Dozer banks into a left turn to close with the MiG-29. He uses radar to see in the dark and maneuver against his target. He fires another missile. The F-117 tells me at that time, about 1,000 feet away from him, he said he looks over, missile goes right in front of him, I fly right in front of him. With the third missile airborne, the MiG-29 breaks back hard left, directly into Dozer. The Serbian pilot is breaking into the attack trying to engage Dozer at close range. So now I'm diving like this. The, the MiG is in a left-hand turn coming up towards me like that. We're 10,000 feet apart. But, you know, here in the back of your neck stands up a little bit. The missile tracks almost straight down, then a burst of flame. So now, like 100 foot of flame or whatever it was, I can see his airplane kind of spiraling with the hit, going downhill. And I continue to kind of do a left-hand turn over the top watching it, quite honestly, not doing anything tactical, because I'm just going, wow, look at that. Because uh, I've never seen that before. It is Dozer's first MiG kill. The MiG-29 spirals down in flame towards the ground below. Dozer pulls up out of his turn and starts climbing back to altitude. The victorious F-15 pilot retakes his position above the strike package and continues the patrol. In modern air combat, there is very little difference between night and day. Precision weapons and long-range radar have made the dogfight a long-distance affair. As technology improves, the distance becomes even more remote. The next generation of fighter aircraft, like the F-22 Raptor, adds stealth to the arsenal of the fighter pilot. I think the future with an F-22 is going to be almost boring, which is good for our side and bad for the enemy. But technology is never static. Every breakthrough spawns a countermeasure. quest to command the sky, day and night, will continue long into the future.